Welcome back to our fourth and last presentation on lifestyle and immunity. Tonight, we're going to be talking about immune boosters, ways that you can strengthen your immune system. And we're going to be doing that by going through in more detail, the Restore Life an acronym. Remember that what we cover tonight are our lifestyle and health recommendations. We're going to go through some of the evidence that are there, but none of this is intended to be specific medical advice for you personally. Please, if there's anything that uh, is going to be a major change, it's always good to check with your, your primary care provider. So we're going to talk about the blue zones. They were first talked about in National Geographic and they were looking into the world's longest living people, the people that lived past 100. And they found that there are about five regions, five different population groups in the world that tended to live past 100. And they researched them and looked to see if there are any common factors as to why they were living past 100. Were there any lifestyle things that caused them to be living longer than your average person? And so they looked and there were nine commonalities and they call these the power nine. And fun fact, they did a Danish twin study, this is separate, but they did a Danish twin study where they studied different twins and their lifestyle to see how that affected longevity. And they found that only about 20% of how long the average person lives is related to genetics and 80% is related to lifestyle. So lifestyle is definitely a factor in longevity. And the power nine that they found that was a commonality between these five regions, group of Adventists in Loma Linda, California, some folks in Costa Rica and Sardinia, Italy, Greece, Okinawa, Japan. They found that they all tended to have lifestyles that promoted natural movement. Movement was a part of their daily life. They also found that all these um, groups tended to have a purpose. They had a reason why they woke up in the morning. They also found that they had regular periods of downshifting, meaning they took time to rest, they enjoyed naps or did happy hour or took time to pray or took time to remember ancestors, different things that enabled relaxing. Another thing was the 80% rule, the Okinawans eat only until they're about 80% full. Another thing is that they all had a plant slant, but largely of what they ate was plant-based. Beans was a cornerstone of a lot of these groups of people's diets. They also found that some of them, if they did drink alcohol or wine, they drank it in moderation. And they also found that among these groups, they all belonged to some sort of faith-based community. And they also found that they tended to put their loved ones first, family came first, and relationships. And they also found that they surrounded themselves with people that promoted health and happiness in their lives. So that's kind of a little overview of the different things that we will be touching on uh, tonight. But that was just a really interesting study and interest that they took up, um, came out in National Geographic a couple, couple years ago. So now we're going to talk about Restore Life. This is what we've been mentioning throughout all the lectures that we've been going on. And now we're actually going to go through and talk about each and every one of them, how different aspects of it can be a benefit, not only to your general health, but your immune system, especially in light of COVID and the different microbes that our body faces every day. So we'll go through each of these and we'll start with relaxation. Relaxation, self-care, stress management. Boy, that's an important one. We looked at during the immune busters, how stress can be a buster of the immune system and kind of weaken. And, and I looked at f several immunologic markers and how those are impaired during times of prolonged stress. So relaxation or ways of managing stress is super beneficial. Some of the benefits of relaxation in general is reducing our stress, which we've talked about. It will boost overall well-being. It improves our ability to concentrate when we relax. And I can tell you when I am deficient on times of, you know, taking times apart or, or slowing down or just, you know, some times of relaxation recovery, it is very hard to concentrate. It just becomes increasingly out of control. It improves our digestion and aids in good circulation, muscle tension decreases. And the net result that we see in some of this is lowering of blood pressure by some, reduces 
our risks for stroke, it promotes emotional health, reduces fatigue, reduces low-grade inflammation in our body, and our heart rate in general may tend to be a few beats slower per minute. So some of the next few slides that we're going to be looking at are going to be looking at ways to promote uh, relaxation and for stress management. And these are things that have actually been studied and looked at. One is this, get out in nature. I mean, how good is that? Getting out in nature has lots of benefits. A growing number of studies uh, support the benefits of getting out in nature, actually measuring to see what is actually happening to our body. It definitely reduces physical and psychological stress. It, it has actually shown that people who spend more time out in nature have increased self-confidence, self-esteem. It's associated with an increased likelihood to exercise when you spend more time outside. And I guess maybe that's because when you're outside, you have to probably walk or actually get there. So it's, it's the, a facilitator. Yeah, exercise. it's a facilitator. And, and creates that natural opportunity. And so this is about moving itself. So exercise is a stress reducer, but uh, exercise is an immune booster, but exercise is also a stress reducer, which also is uh, will boost your immune system that way as well. So it stimulates endorphins, which are natural painkillers. It boosts our mood and uh, will relieve muscle tension. Another way for relaxation, so these are some practical ways, deep breathing. How many of you ever thought about that? Deep breathing. It promotes optimal gas exchange. And this is different than just our regular chest breathing. This is actually fully expanding our lungs and expanding our belly, letting our diaphragm go fully down. So maximally expanding those lung, lungs, filling them with air and letting them out. It has a calming effect. There's a effect on our a heart that will slow it down, stabilize our blood pressure, boost our immune function, decreased effects of stress on mind and body. There are some ways of actually trying to help promote this and even stop and think about it. I, I can tell you, I don't personally stop and think about deep breathing, but it's probably a good idea. And the recommendation in looking at some studies on how this affects us is actually taking time. So if someone were to write you a prescription, take this pill twice a day and it'll lower your blood pressure and induce your immune system and decrease your stress. What if they said, why don't you do practice deep breathing for 15 minutes BID instead of take a pill BID? Well, maybe you still have to do the other two, but this would even help and augment that. So when someone is sick and in the hospital, do you notice in the hospital, if you've ever spent in the hospital, maybe after surgery or something like that, they put this little device on your dinner stand. It's plastic device. It has these balls in it. And you're, okay. So that is actually deep breathing. So it's to promote deep breathing, to keep your lungs fully expanded. It improves blood th flow through your lungs. It prevents atelectasis or collapse of the lower part of the lungs so that you are less likely to develop pneumonia. So there is a actual practical real world thing that they're actually doing in hospitals to practice that. And then there's this. So the blue zones mention this downshifting, some something doing something specifically intentionally and regularly as a day that you are doing something different, setting things apart. Various denominations, there are Christian Sabbatarians and the Jewish community take a Sabbath where they will spend a time not just maybe involved with worship, but actually doing things completely different, putting aside the day, the weekly work, putting aside the normal chores, spending time outside, things like this. So this has actually been studied to see what are the effects and how is this beneficial to our health. It has been found to be of great benefit by doing something consistently and intentionally every week, setting aside the normal routines and worries of life, They've looked at this and said it actually enhances our self-awareness. It improves our self-care. It enriches relationships. It experiences those that practice that experience spiritual development, positive effect on the rest of the week. And groups that participate in things like this will have practices and philosophies that grow over time. So there's growth. And they actually looked at this in 2011 
and from this one study, speaking of the Jewish Sabbath for the Jewish community, the religious practices and traditions that mark the Jewish Sabbath set it apart as a day different from everyday occupations and routines. Sabbath values focused on spirituality, respite, relationship, and community promoted a more balanced lifestyle. And Sabbath keeping continues to have relevance in modern times as it is an oasis to counterbalance the harried pace of modern life with its incessant stimuli and technologies, innovations, and all of those things. Just having a time apart are ways to help us reduce stress. And we'll move on to exercise. And the main point is to be consistently doing something that you enjoy. And we'll talk a little bit about the immune benefits of exercise specifically. It has anti-inflammatory benefits. It promotes bone health and strength. It helps promote circulation and increases immune cell and antibody circulation. So it stimulates your immune system in that way. You also have a brief rise in post-exercise temperature, which could also be a reason for stimulating the immune cells. We could kind of hype them up after a short period of exercise or after you exercise. Like we mentioned earlier, it also lowers stress hormones. And when you do exercise, you tend to feel healthier. It can be a mood booster. You feel more energetic and you feel better about yourself. Specifically related to um, the immune system, they did some recent studies in 2021. And they found that it, like we said, it modulates the immune system and stimulates pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it kind of helps regulate your immune system, um, balancing that inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effect. Increases lymphocyte circulation. Those are the cells, like we mentioned, that are important in general immune response. And then it also increases your immune cell recruitment. So the ability to call forth more cells is boosted by exercise. They also found that individuals who exercise regularly lower the incidence and severity and intensity of symptoms, as well as decrease mortality from viral infections. Another benefit to exercise is it also helps maintain a healthy body weight, which helps prevent different chronic non-communicable diseases like heart disease or diabetes. And you don't need to exercise super crazy. Just a moderate amount of activity is enough to stimulate your immune system. And we kind of mentioned the benefits of being out in nature already. It's a natural stress reducer. It's a mood booster. There's fresh air out there. You might be more likely to exercise and it's beautiful. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the benefits of beholding beauty or experiencing awe. Um, so you hit a lot of different angles if you exercise and you exercise outside. And then like we mentioned, have fun. The point is to do something that you enjoy and that will help you create a habit and something that you look forward to. It won't be laborious or it won't be something that you dread. We have on the screen just some different ideas of what you can do. Like if you don't like to lift weights, don't go lift weights. Find something else. Like go work in the garden, you know, dig a hole or something. <laughs> something that you enjoy to dig it and then fill it back in yeah you could dig a hole <laughs> do it again yep, yeah and fill it, it back in you'll be outside anyways the point is find something that you enjoy doing you i think do. i'd like to lift weights <laughs> <laughs> go for a walk you can kayak um, you can play frisbee or tag with the family or kids there's so many options you can do uh, it's recommend that you exercise moderately so about a the intensity of about a brisk walk for about 30 to 40 minutes, five to seven days a week. And so find something that you like to do and enjoy doing, get a group of friends together, play a game of Frisbee. You'll get your exercise in without even really thinking about it. And before you start anything um, new, especially if it's new or intense, as far as exercise go, and you have health concerns or are worried about starting something new, it's always good to check and run by any changes with your healthcare provider. Okay, sleep. Sleep as a immune booster. If we rob ourselves of even one hour, so a one hour or more of sleep per night, we can reduce our immune system function by as much as 50%. Oh my goodness, isn't that crazy? 
that was probably the time I got COVID because I stayed up late and my immune system was down. I don't know. There's some practical recommendations about adequate sleep. I mean, it ranges definitely based on age and, and uh, individuals, but I'd say on average between seven and nine hours sleep. The most important time for sleep probably is those hours before midnight. Isn't that interesting? So they've actually shown that that um, that time before midnight, whether it's 10 to 12 or 9 to 12, is very, very important compared to, you know, it's it, all sleep is not equal as far as our circadian rhythms and restoration is concerned. So let's go on and look at some of the immune benefits. So again, just like all the things with immune benefits, reduced stress hormones, protection against inflammation, increase in growth hormones, prolactin, melatonin, and leptin is all promoted with sleep and during our proper sleep cycles. It promotes immune cell movement, both in blood, tissues, and lymphs, and enhances cytokine function by having adequate sleep. It also helps in that, uh, remember the special forces, the adaptive immune mechanisms of responding and setting up an immune response after you've been exposed to something. So that immune memory with those memory B and T cells and having proper sleep promotes overall health and well-being. What happens during our sleep is there's two, I think, two things that are happening during sleep and, and wakefulness. So cortisol kind of comes up and rises in our system when this with the sun, and melatonin rises in our system when it gets dark. So these hormones are produced and regulated and function in various ways with our sleep cycle. Melatonin itself is a natural antioxidant. It is, has antiviral properties and anti-inflammatory properties and is generated during sleep hours. It's associated with down regulation of overreactive immune systems. So if our immune system is overactive, it, it helps downregulate and keep it in check. Uh, so you can see if you're not getting as much sleep, you're not producing as much melatonin, you're not getting as much exposure during a 24 hour period because your sleep cycle is cut short, then you may suffer and your immune system may suffer because of it. Age, the aging body produces less melatonin. It is uh, known. And so adults, older adults may need to consider a supplement uh, of two to three milligrams of melatonin uh, 30 minutes before bedtime. Let's go on to sleep hygiene. Think of sleep as medicine. It is a time of restoration, as a time of your body correcting itself and just kind of fixing things and restoring things from the day. And so a good sleep hygiene pattern is really important. One thing is to keep a consistent wake time. So you're getting up to the same time and going to bed close to the same time. So you're you're having a consistent pattern going on, <clears throat> putting away screen time. So stopping your screen time with whatever screen you're using an hour before bedtime is also helpful for promoting good sleep hygiene and good restfulness. How many of you have ever just gone to sleep and just laid in bed and couldn't fall asleep? Sometimes stress is a killer of that. You got things on your mind and various things or you're overtired. And so there's a list of things that you can do to promote yourself falling asleep when you go to bed. Most people initiate sleep probably within 10 to 20 minutes maximum. If they say if it's more than 20 minutes after initiating sleep, you probably should get up and don't necessarily do something super active, but you'd some type of quiet activity that maybe promote you to get tired so you can actually fall asleep. I think one thing that's here about sleep hygiene is to avoid activities of wakefulness in bed. Sometimes we can't fall asleep, so we turn on the light and read a book, or we turn on the TV or something like that, or pull out the computer. Those are activities of wakefulness, and we can actually condition our body to stay awake whenever we reach the bed. So when you get into a real insomnia cycle, there's things like that that can happen, and you have to be really intentional about some, some of these things. How many of you ever woken during the night and looked at the clock and then thought, oh my goodness, I need four more hours of sleep or my plane's leaving in four hours and I, I need to get back to sleep. And of course you can't, all you're doing is thinking about how you need to get back to sleep. So apparently I guess looking at the clock can sometimes uh, make that more difficult, but developing a routine, a sleep routine that you enjoy.
All right, we'll briefly touch on temperance. We, this is basically the idea of avoiding harmful things to our body and consuming or doing healthy things in moderation. We talked about these mostly in our last lecture, which I'll just briefly mention. We saw how last time nicotine and smoking cigarettes or tobacco or marijuana can be harmful for our lungs and all these can impact our immune system in a negative way. So these would be things to avoid or at least limit your contact with very much. And then this is just a brief slide about all the different health risks with some of the different things out there. Opiates decrease phagocytosis and antibody production. And they actually found that THC alters the normal function of T and B lymphocytes as well as natural killer cells or macrophages. And this is a quote from the study that this information came from. It said the broad spectrum of THC on the immune functions is thought to decrease in the host resistance to bacteria and viral what, infections. What's, what's THC on you? They're still studying cocaine. They're not quite sure what that does yet, but it seems like everything else to have an immunosuppressive effect. And nicotine is also immunosuppressive. Frances E. Williard, I think, captured the idea of temperance best. She said, temperance is moderation in things that are good and total absence from the things that are foul. And I would add harmful. So, oh, restore life. We're on O. Ownership is kind of about, we all have a choice and to, claim that, reclaim that power of choice that we all have been given and own it. When I was in nursing school and doing rotations in the hospital, I had the opportunity to take care of one patient. And basically as a nursing student, we were there to just do an assessment and practice our technique. So I went to her room and asked her if I could do an assessment. And she was in the middle of opening the package. So she asked if I could come back later. I said, okay, sure. So I went with the nurse I was with and followed her around while we passed out medications. And then I came back and the lady, she saw that I came back in and she got really upset. And I was like, no, we're like, go away. And she yelled at me to leave. And so I thought, okay, I'll come back later. She's not ready for me to do my assessment. That's not really necessary. I mean, it's good practice for me, but it's probably annoying for her. So I left. And then like a couple minutes later, she called back um, she actually called the nurse's station and said, hey, can you send that, that little nurse back in? So she called me back in. So I went in there and she said, you know, I'm just so sorry. Uh, you can do your assessment. You know, I'm just really worried. Um, I have to have a lobectomy. I have to take part of my lungs out because I have lung cancer. And she was crying and she just, I just remember she told me she felt so powerless and out of control. And I felt really bad for her because lung cancer related to smoking is often something that can be prevented. You know, we can, can't prevent all things in life, but decreasing risk is something we can do. And so taking ownership of our health now and making healthy choices now can help prevent us from becoming in a, in a situation later where we feel like we're out of control and have no choice. I think just remembering that we are all unique individuals. We're one of a kind. We are all a limited addition and very special. So treating ourselves with respect and know that we're worth it. The decisions and choices we make can have lasting ramifications. And whether we find ourselves in a good situation or bad situation, we can still face it you know, with a clear head moving forward and just make the best out of whatever situation we're in. Remedies, so R, restore. So there are some remedies. I mean, I'm not talking about typical things that you might be prescribed that would be different. We're talking more about natural remedies or things that are simple and available to pretty much everybody. And how this even relates to COVID-19 is really important. Hydrotherapy was something that has been used actually since back before the turn of, hmm, well, it'd be the 
late mm -hmm. 1800s, right? And even the Egyptians and Romans did some types of it too. Yeah. So here in this country, John Harvey Kellogg in a large hospital sanitarium back in the 1800s used hydrotherapy to treat patients with various modalities where they'd use hot and cold treatments and, and water therapy in different ways but specifically during the Spanish flu. Okay, so that's kind of relevant to us. And some of this data, you really didn't have detailed studies back then, but they actually did have some compiled data, some pretty simple numbers that you could look at and compare the state-of-the-art way of treating the, the uh, patients during the Spanish flu in the 1918-1919 pandemic that hit this country. And the comparison was comparing the soldiers that came back from the war from Europe and were here and who had contracted the Spanish flu and they were being treated with the state-of-the-art technology of the day in the military hospitals. And they compared the outcomes and the numbers as far as numbers of people infected and the number of people that died with those who were being treated in the sanitarium and other facilities like that where they were using natural remedies and specifically hydrotherapy. They were using both foot baths two times a day. They would do hot fomentations, which is basically like a, a hot blanket or a hot thermal a device that was placed on the shoulders or chest until it was allowed to cool. And then it was followed by a brisk rubbing of the skin so this was to promote circulation. They thought this was actually going to help, you know, improve breathing and things like that. And in fact, what they found, the outcomes, the number of deaths in the sanitarium where they were using hydrotherapy versus the military hospitals, the outcomes were much, much better. And they weren't using the typical therapies that they were using in the, in the military hospitals for the soldiers. It was so impressive to during COVID-19 to a critical care pulmonologist in his ICU. He was so impressed by that data since we had no treatment to actually treat COVID-19 except supportive care. He thought, why not add this in his ICU? So he added hydrotherapy and hot fermentations and, and hot and cold baths and things like that. He added that when he was able to in his ICU to promote the recovery because the idea was that it, it it improved the respiration and improved the outcomes uh, back then during the Spanish flu. And he thought there was enough data to warrant doing during that today. I thought that was pretty interesting. So what is some of the science uh, behind some of this hydrotherapy idea? Well, to use heat to treat or prevent viral infections. And again, this is what this uh, recent modern day pulmonologist was doing in his ICU. But we know that from regular sauna baths, it enhances cardiovascular respiration, immune function, boosts mood, enhances overall quality of life, reduces risks of all-cause mortality, risks of cardiac disease, cerebral vascular disease, high blood pressure, stroke, neurocognitive disease, skin conditions, rheumatic disease, and headache. So we know that moist heat actually can improve circulation, improve immune function, and improve outcomes, not just infection disease, but in other diseases as well. Hot air treats respiratory infections, reduces viral shedding, improves the course of a cold, aids in relaxation. And it's something that really is available to anybody. If someone was out in the middle of nowhere, had no hospital available to them, they could have this available to them. And there's actually some really sig significant evidence to show that it can be a benefit. We know that it boosts the immune system, it promotes circulation, it aids again in vascular health, improves skin and muscle tone, and improves mental health. One way to do something like this at home is actually doing hot and cold showers. Very simple. That change in temperature helps promote circulation. And this is a good thing. I know some people, a friend of mine who's a cardiologist, his wife is an internist at a internal medicine residency in Ohio. And they are regularly doing this during this COVID season to improve their immune function so that they will be better equipped if they're exposed to either have a lesser disease or maybe even to fight off the infection before it starts. 
So when you start hot and cold showers, though, I can tell you this isn't fun. <laughs> they say to do it in steps. Well, I don't know if I can get past step one. <laughs> Basically, starting by you know taking a warm shower, uh, not too hot, maybe as hot as you can stand it, and then uh, letting the water run on your upper back and neck when you turn it to cold. Of course, very quickly, you're gonna turn it back to warm because you might be able to stand that for about one or two seconds. And the idea is to start slow and to try to adjust where you can actually do something in a more a specific way. This would be the regular official way to have a contrast shower. Start with warm water, increase to the highest tolerable temperature, um, 110 degrees, hold it for one minute, lower the temperature to the, to the coldest tolerable temperature, 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds, let me tell you, that is gonna seem like a long time. And you repeat this one or two times for two or more cycles, three cycles of hot and three cycles of cold total, and then lower to a neutral temperature for one and one and a half minutes, and then end on cold. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're going right to bed, I say then you can end on cold. <laughs> then you end can end on warm, warm end on if warm, you're yeah. going to bed. If you're going okay. right to bed. Then I would recommend only doing this <laughs> at night before bedtime. <laughs> no. But this is how this works. And so there's some evidence both with physical modalities or hot and cold showers where this can really help promote immune function and circulation. When you're done, drive vigorously, very vigorously, especially if you're on cold and get dressed very quickly. <laughs> Other treatments, cold compresses, cold mittens. We mentioned fomentations of how they do these. You know, the physical therapists have these things called hydroculators where they have these warm devices that where they warm up and they actually put them on you. So physical therapy uses some modalities like this. Let's talk a little bit about supplements for healing. Um, vitamin D. So these are some supplements that are associated specifically with... Uh, viral infections, and uh, perhaps even related to COVID-19 that, that may be of benefit. We've, you've heard in the press about vitamin D, how this can be important. There's been some mixed data on this specifically, but we know vitamin D does help modulate the immune response. It supports the innate immune function. It aids in regulation of the immune system itself. A deficiency would be something less than 30 nanograms per milliliter can be associated with an increased susceptibility to infection. We know vitamin D also, on a positive note, promotes bone health and calcium regulation. Zinc is uh, something that supports gene regulation in the immune cells, and it's an antioxidant, and so deficiencies in zinc can increase susceptibility to infection, compromising both the innate and the adaptive immune systems. Quercetin is an antioxidant. It stimulates the immune system. It has antiviral activity, decreases pro-inflammatory cytokines. And its source, it comes actually from vegetables, onions, broccoli, berries, grapes, uh, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, vitamin C is, is certainly a potent antioxidant. It supports immune cell function. Many have taken vitamin C, especially during the cold and flu season. We know that vitamin C enhances chemotaxis and phagocytosis and the function of those immune cells in, in recognizing, attacking, and clearing infections. Uh, NAC or N-acetylcysteine is also a supplement that may be of benefit, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immune modulating, all of these things. Decreases the frequency of influenza. It does uh, reduce the severity of pneumonia in some studies as well if you take 600 milligrams twice a day. Um, selenium is an antioxidant as well, also helps support the immune system. We talked about melatonin. Echinacea is another one. Garlic enhances the immune function. Next, we're going to talk about emotions. Um, as we learned last time, negative emotions can have an impact on our immune system. So we're gonna briefly touch on the benefits of cultivating positive emotions. Managing stress, we've pretty much covered already, but we'll touch on that too. Must be really important. And then we'll talk about investigating the root of our emotions as well. 
So practicing gratitude, this is a practical way to help boost positive emotions and kind of suppress or decrease negative ones. They found that gratitude significantly increases happiness, improves physical health, sleep, is a booster to our immune system and decreases risk of disease. Practical ways to practice gratitude is to have a gratitude journal. You could spend a couple minutes at night just reflecting on the day and some things that you're grateful for just to drop them down. And that's useful and nice to have, you know, maybe in low times to go back and remind yourself of some positive things that has happened. Another idea is to keep positive notes or quotes or sayings around in places where you can see them just to promote something happy and gratitude that you see around throughout your day. Another fun idea is to have a gratitude jar. This can be really fun to do with your family or if you have kids where everyone writes down something that they're thankful for or grateful for, something that made them laugh, throw it in the jar and then at the dinner table or a certain time, just pull one out and read read it and talk about it. it can be a fun thing to do. Next, like we talked about earlier, the importance and significance of beauty, specifically the significance of the awe emotion. Um, experiencing awe is when you see the Grand Canyon and you think, oh, wow, you're just kind of overwhelmed with a sense of wonder. They found this specific feeling is associated with boosting the mood, depresses stress. It's an anti-inflammatory. And they actually did a study um, at Berkeley where they had, uh, I don't know how big it was, but they had a group of people stare at the trees for 90 seconds and they had a group of other people stare at a science building for 90 seconds. And they found afterwards that the people who stared at trees were more likely to help others and think outside themselves than someone who just stared at a building. It also is shown to stimulate wonder and curiosity and in that way can help facilitate scientific learning and reasoning in children. And overall, it just promotes greater well-being. And some practical ways to experience awe is to keep note of things that inspire awe in you and visit those or experience those every now and then. Now, you don't necessarily have to go somewhere. They said listening to inspiring music or watching an inspiring um, video or just looking at an inspiring picture, those things that facilitate that same feeling, if it's, even if it's not actually going outside to a specific place can have the same effect as well. So that is reasonable and accessible even in our daily lives here, even if we're stuck in time. So this was put out by the Mayo Clinic for four simple ways or approaches to dealing with stress. They call it the four A's of stress. The first was to avoid unnecessary stress. So learn to say no was part of it as well as organizing and managing your tasks to avoid unnecessary stress. Another one is if you can alter the situation, maybe change your mindset about how you're thinking about it, communicate your feelings openly when appropriate, and maybe learn to manage time better and state limits in advance. They're just some ideas. Another one is to adapt to the stressor. If the stressor can't be changed, maybe we have to make um, some changes in our own lives. Sometimes we have to change our own expectations. Perfection isn't always necessary. Maybe we have to think about it in a different way. And sometimes looking at the big picture can help us see things from a different angle. Another thing is to accept the stressors that are unchangeable. Talking with someone can help with this process. Um, forgiving can bring a lot of relief, as well as practicing positive self-talk and learning from our mistakes. So those are some, some practical ways. Some other practical ways that we touched on would be some deep breathing, doing some stretching, muscle relaxation, exercising, rocking in a rocking chair, massage, having a spa day, going out in nature. There's many things we can do to help manage our stress and reminding ourselves to find joy in life, even in the little things. This is about investigating the root. I thought it was very interesting because I do believe it plays a big role in our stress management. Beliefs influence our emotions, which influence our thoughts, which influence our beliefs. I think it goes the other way as well. But um, finding the root cause, I think, is important. Sometimes emotions can be a signal of something that's going on underneath. And if we take the time to look deeper, we can often find something that we can uh, make a change and make a difference in. And last class, we reviewed how stress and negative emotions and specifically suppressing thoughts and not dealing with different things in our lives can be immune suppressing.
liquid. So we've talked about water intake and its immune health benefits already. We know that it is important for helping transport nutrients through our body and to our various cells and for fighting off invaders. Staying well hydrated helps detoxify waste, helps facilitate the lymph circulation and drainage, and can help in a number of things. Sometimes we're hungry, but really we're thirsty. And so a lot of times at the end of the day, we're stressed, we're under some things, we go to reach for a snack and put something in our mouth when really our body is, is asking for water. Sometimes instead of reaching for that thing in between meals to ask yourself, hmm, when's the last time I drank some water and have a glass of water, eight or 16 ounces right at that time, it's a great appetite suppressant and can help with that in between meal eating it is also important for our bodies to burn fat. We would rather not burn muscle and we would rather burn fat preferentially. So staying well hydrated can help facilitate that. So those are some, I think, important things that water can serve in helping us achieve and maintain ideal body weight. Our body is 65% water. I grew up uh, when I was young in front of a television and watching every Star Trek episode on the planet. And one of the episodes basically called humans bags of mostly water. And so that's basically what we are. We're bags of mostly water and much of our body, much, many of our organs are made up of water. So everything and every body function is dependent on that. You know, we can go without things for a fairly significant period of time, but there's two things. One, the most important thing is oxygen. We can't go without that for probably more than six to eight minutes. And water, we can't go more than just a few days. So it's one of those top priority things. Typically, if you take your body weight, divide it by two, that would give you the number of ounces. Divide that by eight would give you the number of cups per day that we should be drinking. And on average, you've heard people say we should drink eight glasses of water. Now that's kind of bumped up a little bit, but if we're doing six to eight glasses of water, we're doing pretty good. And could you do a little bit even better? Yeah, we can, but six to eight glasses of water is pretty good. And when we say six to eight glasses of water, we don't mean counting your orange juice and your cup of coffee and your tea, but we mean six to eight glasses of pure water. I think they actually recommend for every cup of coffee to have an additional cup of water just because coffee is a diuretic. Yep, coffee and alcohol as well. For alcohol, they recommend two extra cups of water. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to talk about intimacy, healthy relationships and social connection. And last week we looked at or not last week, the beginning of this week, we looked at how so social isolation can be a detriment to our immune system. So briefly, there are some qualities of a healthy relationship, but generally healthy relationships and good social connections decrease stress, decrease feelings of social isolation and loneliness. They boost your immunity. It speeds up healing, increases resilience overall, and promotes longevity and tends to lower blood pressure and promotes better health. Some practical things to do as far as maintaining healthy relationships and social connections is to make time for them. Make time to cultivate relationships that are in your life, especially with COVID. Take time to connect with people. It's harder in person, but if you can do that, if not, you can write, you can call, you can video chat, you can always meet up for a walk out in the fresh air. Another way to find a group to hang out with is to volunteer. Volunteering is a great way to find people to connect with. Other ways can be get involved with church or a religious group or a book club or a knitting club or a soccer club or a ping pong club. Just find somewhere where you can connect with people. And now we will briefly talk about food. This is a large section, so I'm going to try to speed through it. Whole plant-based foods are immune supportive overall health supportive as well. This includes green leafy vegetables, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and healthy fats. Healthy fats are basically your unsaturated fats found in avocados, nuts, and some olive oil and things like that. There's a brief picture about what the majority of your plate should look like, mostly vegetables, a little bit less protein, and some whole grains. Immune benefits of eating whole food plant-based 
is it reduces and prevents inflammation via antioxidants and flavonoids. Those are very, very high and naturally found in a lot of the vegetables and fruits. Helps maintain healthy balance of immune cells. It protects against lifestyle related disease such as diabetes. Antioxidants are anti cancer. And this also aids in maintaining ideal body weight as these foods, vegetables, fruits, um, whole grains are naturally low in calories versus processed foods. They can also be antiviral, antimicrobial. This is mainly the citrus fruits, and they also help promote a healthy gut biome, microbiome, which we learned in the beginning about how that's important for immune function as well. Also eating healthy will feel better about yourself as well as have a mood boost and have a healthy self-esteem. Meal timing, intermittent fasting. Um, they've actually found that this reduces inflammation. It's protective once again, against certain lifestyle related diseases that actually enhances insulin sensitivity. So it helps insulin go into your cells. Um, it promotes cellular stress resistance. So that improves uh, the function of your cells overall, as well as your immune cells. It up regulates, that's a typo, but key proteins that help regulate metabolism, DNA repair and immune system function. So important for overall health and repairing and creating new cells. It also tends to trigger adaptive immune response and this helps prime for stressors and antigen encounters. To practically try out some intermittent fasting, there's a bunch of different ones. Um, there's a 24 hour fast where you stop eating completely. Those are difficult because you get very hungry. The time restricted eating where you have periods where you don't eat and periods where you do eat like a window of eating time and a window of no eating time. That's the easiest to and most natural for us to incorporate because we already have a period of fast at nighttime when we're sleeping. So time restricted eating is the easiest to incorporate for the most part, but everything's a little bit different for everyone. So it might not, I won't say it works for everyone. They actually found intermittent fasting helps burn fat. So during that fasting period, your body tends to burn fat instead of sugar while maintaining muscle. So intermittent fasting is a great way to try to zap that extra fat that you're trying to get rid of. It helps sharpen your mind and promotes longevity overall. So intermittent fasting and drinking water. Mm -hmm. And they found that drinking about two cups 30 minutes before a meal you ate 22% less calories. And so this is just a visual of how we should strive to build our diets. Try to have the bulk of it be fruits and vegetables and whole grains and a smaller portion of it, maybe less on the nuts and seeds and, and processed uh, meat alternatives. Try to not do so much processed foods and avoid sugars and high fat. It's all about trying to make the transition from what we typically eat in America to something more healthful. And you don't have to make big changes at a time. Just think of, you know, maybe I could have another serving of broccoli today, or maybe I can add a, another serving of squash the next day. Just think of making small little transitions and any transition, anything in a positive direction for your health will be a good thing for both your overall health and your immune system. We talked about supplements very briefly, and I'll just say that a majority of the supplements that are beneficial for your health and antioxidants are found naturally inside the whole foods and the whole grains. Ethics. So ethics is the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. So the moral code or the principle, the values between what's right or what's wrong, what, what drives us, what directs us, what helps us make our decisions, what's the standard code of conduct or beliefs, what is it, what is it in faith? What is it in religion? What is it in society that drives our thinking and our decisions? This is the slide that you showed, right? Our beliefs, 
bring forth our emotions, which can bring forth thoughts, or our beliefs can bring for us our thoughts that can bring forth emotions. So it can go both ways, you're saying, right? And sometimes we can get stuck in a loop of understanding or thinking certain ways, patterns of thinking things, but our beliefs, our thoughts and emotions ultimately are governed by what we believe. What are the principles and the ethics that drive us? This is about, when we're thinking about ethics and morals and what drives us, many of us in life, either directly or indirectly, have experienced perhaps some type of moral injury, or perhaps maybe we've delivered some type of moral injury to someone. It's a relatively new topic of study. There are a few studies done and are typically with military servicemen and veterans where some type of moral injury can cause a significant impact in mental health. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs wrote this, moral injury can occur in reaction to a traumatic event in which deeply held morals or values are violated. The resulting distress may lead to PTSD, depression, and other disorders in which feelings such as guilt, shame, and betrayal, and anger are predominant. Although these feelings may occur in the absence of a formal disorder. Although most research has been conducted, has focused on military veterans, moral injury can occur outside of military complexes. So sometimes we're in a situation and our morals are somehow violated either against us or maybe we're forced to act in a way that's against our internal moral code. And some of this can lead to big time distress and shame and guilt and things like that. Uh, you remember in our first, one of our first slides, we talked about the blue zone. So one of the features found of these nine features in the blue zones is that a commonality was that faith, religion, spirituality of some sort was, was present and prominent in these zones where people were living a long time. So when they in interviewed the, the 263 centurions, the people that were over 100 years or older, all of them, every single one of them, all but five belong to some faith-based community. The research has looked at uh, those that are actually attending faith-based services are four, four times per month will add between four and 14 years of life expectancy. That's pretty impressive. That's a pretty interesting study and in statistic. Longevity certainly can come from that. This is just a slide that was kind of more of a model of, of why this might be the case, why our beliefs, our faith-based beliefs or whatever, promote certain positive ways of dealing with life and how these interact with, with our thinking. And then it leads to up at the top decisions, lifestyle choices. These are about owning it, right? Healthy behaviors. But then on the bottom side, also these things, these uh, positive ways of dealing with life and, and things also affect our genetics. Well, how does it affect our genetics, our development? our experiences, our personality. Well, genetics can be affected not, you know, you can't change the genes, but you can change the gene expression. We call this this whole area of epigenetics. And we know that, that the ways we think, the ways we deal with things and cope with things, that our genes actually can be turned on or turned off and expressed in different ways, specifically as it relates to our mood and our, and, and our health and in various ways. You have survived the Restore Life class. <laughs> Just to recap, take time to relax, strive to increase activity in your life and to get optimal sleep, seven, seven to nine hours, ideally. Avoid harmful things and incorporate positive things into your life. Take responsibility and take charge of your health while you can and employ natural remedies when appropriate. Take care and listen to your emotions and mental health, drink plenty of water, cultivate um, healthy relationships and good social connection, drive for incorporating more whole food, plant-based items into your diet, letting go of some processed ones, avoid moral injury to yourself and causing that to other people, 
and consider incorporating faith, spiritual, or religious things into your life. Some resources for further reading if you're interested. They have different books on the blue zones. Dr. John Campbell wrote a book about how not to die and how to survive a pandemic. There's some websites on hydrotherapy by Bruce Thompson. He's in Australia. He made um, the website specifically for COVID. That's really interesting. Um, Life and Health, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and the Adventist uh, Medical Evangelism Network with COVID-19 resources. This is just a tip of the iceberg of what else is out there for your further reading and interest. You know, there's kind of a range. It's really thought that uh, intermittent fast would be 12 hours, which is pretty simple. Let's say, what time would you eat breakfast? Seven o'clock? If your last meal of the day, the last thing you consumed was uh, at 7 p.m. or before, that would be 12 hour fast. So 12 hour fasting can go that way. Some people are suggesting even maybe a little longer, up to 16 hours, which would mean probably your last meal of the day would be, you know, three or four or five. And then eating, you, you can count the hours, you can get close mm -hmm. to that if you're, you know, eating breakfast at six or seven or something like that. I think the idea between having a longer time of fasting is a longer time of fat burn. I think that's right. why they would promote. The other thing that's important, there's other hormonal things that happen during that fasting thing. And a friend of mine who is very much into longevity and some of the research and studies, when I, I've asked him, what is the one most in fact, important factor that leads to, you know, helps lead to or aid to longevity and a healthy longer life? Um, and when it comes to some of these issues, his question is pretty much simple. It's intermittent fasting. It is very doable. And the spoiler yeah. is when I go to reach for something in the evening, when I'm just a little bored or thirsty and I reach for something to break that fast instead of waiting till morning to break that fast, right? Well, that would be your practice. So, you know, to, 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 to have your late last meal of the day at an early time and your first meal in the morning, that would be every day you'd be doing that. They do say it takes about three, three to four weeks for your body to adjust to the fasting period. So you might be kind of tired and maybe grouchy while you're getting used to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to adjust, to, 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 uh, to uh, adapt your meal schedule. But, you know, so often I think if you get in, if we're in the habit of eating our last meal of the day at eight o'clock, you know, or nine o'clock, I think part of that intermittent fast too is that you have about six hours between your last meal and when you actually go to bed. I think there's some health value in that as well. Mm -hmm. And the intermittent fasting is, is really nice because like how we were talking about, you can fit it into your day. You can make it a part mm -hmm. of your everyday life without feeling like you're starving yourself, you know, normally at those times and then have your automatic fasting period when you're mostly going to be sleeping. Unlike doing a 24 hour fast during the day when you're thinking about being hungry and your stomach's growling, <laughs> it's a little bit easier. Yeah. That do, and that doesn't mean there isn't going to be exceptions. There's times in traveling or your routine has changed or something happens or something comes up. I mean, those things are going to happen. But when you're just talking, what is the general trend or practice of my you know, eating mm -hmm. schedule? That's one that is going to be promote health and wellness and longevity mm -hmm. if we can develop eating patterns like that. Mm -hmm. And that's an important concept to take into any of these areas that we talked about. You know, what is the general trend of my habits? Mm -hmm. versus the one intermittent sporadic thing. So if there's something that you heard tonight in Restore Life that maybe you're not currently doing, or maybe there's a list of things, I, don't start with the whole list. Pick one <laughs> and do that and, yeah. and, and make that part of your life and incorporate in it. I've spent some time and with a, a lifestyle center that promotes a lot of these types of things in talking to the director, it's more of an inpatient program, but in talking to the director, you know, I asked him, what would you do is for just the rest of us who don't, you know, don't have this controlled environment. He said, pick one thing mm -hmm. and make that your change. And, and my mom, she used to always say good, better, 
best, never let it rest till the good is better and the better is best. So there are things that are for the best lifestyle and, and wherever we are is to pick that those things that are good and make our aim high for those things that are best.